Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning on this Palm Sunday. Let's take a moment and greet our neighbors. Our service theme for this Palm Sunday is our King's greatest glory is his humility. Our gospel lesson for this morning shows Jesus entering Jerusalem in humility. And Jesus does this to teach a point. He has not come in great pomp to receive our sacrifices and service as an earthly king might. No, Jesus came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Our king's greatest glory is in his humility. A humility which led him to the cross in order that he might glorify us. And Jesus also asks us to follow in his humility in our daily lives. Therefore, let us sing to our king, Hosanna. And this word translated means, save us please. Hosanna in the highest. We will now begin by singing hymn 8, Come, O Precious Ransom, Come. It's an Advent hymn, as you can tell by the snow outside. It's an Advent hymn, but really it's also a Palm Sunday sim hymn. Hymn 8, Come, O Precious Ransom, Come. worship for this morning is the service of the word on page 38 in the front of your hymnals page 38 please turn to that now and please stand the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you we have come into the presence of God who created us to love and to serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him 
and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palms in his path, so may we also always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence. He lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. be seated. Our first lesson is from the book of Zechariah chapter 9 verses 9 and 10. A prophecy written between four and five hundred years before Jesus fulfilled it. A prophecy of how he would enter Jerusalem on a colt on the foal of a donkey. Notice in here that our king is talked about as being righteous and having salvation. He has the righteousness we need before God that he gives us freely through faith in him. He was coming to win the salvation that we need from our sins. Salvation that he would accomplish only a few days later on the cross. Let us read this prophecy from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. He will rule his rule would extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is our first lesson. Let us now join together in singing Psalm 24 on page 73 in the front of your hymnals. Psalm 24 on page 73. This, the psalm will be sung responsively. I will sing the first half of each verse and the congregation is invited to sing the second half of each verse but all of the refrain and the glory be to the Father.
for he established it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, he will receive blessing from God his Savior. Let the Lord enter. He is the King of glory. Lift up your heads, O oh, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he? This King of glory, the Lord Almighty, He is the King of glory. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the Our second lesson is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This will serve as our sermon text for this morning. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. We will now hear the Sunday School children sing another version of Psalm 24, King of Kings.
Let us stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for us this morning is recorded in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. It is the account of Jesus approaching Jerusalem and the crowds worshiping as the Son of David, praying to him, Hosanna, save us, we pray. We read, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with a colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. <laughs> This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. We will now sing hymn 134, O Bride of Christ Rejoice, hymn 134.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Our sermon text for this morning is the second lesson, the Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. It's printed in your bulletins, and you're welcome to follow along during the course of the sermon. But let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, we ask you to be with us as we hear your word. Help us see your marvelous humility that came to serve, that put us first. Such great love you have for us. You are our King of glory, and yet humbly you go to die on the cross for us. Lord, we thank you for your salvation. And help us imitate your humility in our lives, for this is your will for us. Amen. As a kid, I used to love professional wrestling. But you know what? I can't stand it anymore. I know there might be many of you who love wrestling, and I won't judge you if you love wrestling. You know, there is some sort of excitement. You see, before the match, the lights are low, and the music is loud, and everyone is cheering, and then the bad guy comes out, usually has some name like Kane or The Undertaker. And then he's talking about how he's going to pile drive his opponent into the grave. And then the music gets really exciting. And out comes the hero of the match. Someone like Stone Cold Austin or The Rock. Shows you how long ago I know about wrestling. I don't know if those guys are even around. People are cheering and then he flexes and shows off his steroid built body and talks about how he's a wrestling god on this earth. And then the fight begins. Well, why am I talking about wrestling on Palm Sunday? There's a couple of reasons. First of all, Palm Sunday is sort of like, sort of like, the pre-fight pageantry of a wrestling match. Yes, there was a battle about to begin between Christ and his opponents, sin, death, and the devil. The Lord got the crowds ready to welcome mankind's true hero who is the Son of God and truly is God on this earth. The crowds chanted his name and who he is. They said, Hosanna, save us please. But Palm Sunday is also very different from wrestling pageantry. You see, wrestling pageantry marks the beginning of some meaningless fight. Whereas Palm Sunday marked the beginning of a fight that had total meaning for all of us, for all of mankind. A fight which outcome would mean our eternity. There's another reason why I me mentioned wrestling, and it has to do with our text. Do you know what the main reason is why I can't stand wrestling? It's because of the attitude of the wrestlers. I can't stand the arrogance. I know it's all a show, but the arrogance and the selfish attitude of wrestlers that they act out is exactly why many people like watching wrestling. You see, people love arrogance because our human nature is proud and selfish. We all would like to be brash like them. And consider the contrast on this Palm Sunday between a wrestler and Jesus. A wrestler pretends that he is God on this earth when he really is nothing. And Jesus, who really is God, made himself nothing. Today we want to look at the attitude of Jesus. And why? Because it's so different than the attitude that is promoted in the world. The world tells us to be brash and always looking out for yourself, number one. But Jesus teaches us to be humble and self-sacrificing. 
Look at Jesus' attitude. The attitude that saved us. And the attitude that exalted him. Now in this portion of Paul's letter to the Philippians, Paul encourages his readers to live in harmony with one another. Right before our text, if you were to open your Bibles and look at the verses that are right before our text, they read thus, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each one of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now we don't know whether pride or selfishness was a particular problem in Philippi, but we do know that those are problems that are ingrained in our sinful human heart. The attitudes of the heart. So what kind of attitude then is God pleased with? Do we please him when we act like professional wrestlers, all macho and brash and arrogant? Certainly not. This is what Paul writes, the first verse in our text. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. It should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. If we claim to be followers of Christ, then we certainly want to act like Christ. Well, what is Christ's attitude? Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Take a moment to really consider what Paul is saying here. Jesus is in very nature God. He is and has what all humans strive to be according to their sinful natures. That's right. According to our sinful natures, we all want to be gods. That's the goal of our life according to our sinful nature. This is how the devil got our first parents, Adam and Eve, to, to sin. Do you remember? He said, if you eat this fruit, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. We, by nature, want an easy life. We want riches. We desire power. And do you think if we ever achieved those things that we would easily give them up? When's the last time you heard of a billionaire giving up all his money and riches in order to become poor? When did you ever hear of a dictator gladly and willingly handing all of his power over to the people? No, this is not the attitude of man. But this is the attitude of Jesus. Jesus, who is in very nature God, who had it all, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Jesus did not find his greatest glory in being God, in having all power, in demanding to be served by others. No, Jesus knew that this was not true glory. Instead, what was Jesus' desire? To save us. To save us who were lost in sin. To save us who could not save ourselves and who did nothing to deserve to be saved. In fact, we probably did everything to prevent Jesus from saving us because of our arrogant attitudes and our sinful relationship with him. And yet, that was his desire to save us. This was his goal. What a difference there is. What a difference there is between Christ Jesus and us. His main goal was not to be served, but to serve and to save. And because Jesus had, did, had this attitude, he also did some amazing things. First of all, Jesus made himself nothing. The Greek text literally says he emptied himself. Jesus didn't just write a check to charity. He emptied himself 
of all the glory and power that was his. He gave it all up in order to take on the very nature of a servant. Now when's the last time you ever heard of an earthly ruler doing something like that, willingly taking on the role of a servant? Sure, there are times when our leaders, either for PR or for maybe genuinely wanting to honor those who, who serve us, will take on the role of service. For example, you might hear every once in a while of a president serving Thanksgiving dinner to our troops or maybe to a food pantry. But that, but not even a president would consider to empty himself the way Jesus emptied himself for us. God took on human flesh and blood. This is humiliation in and of itself. But Jesus went further than that. He went to be born in poverty. He went on to become a despised man in humility. In humility, he was riding to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to become obedient to even more suffering, even more mistreatment from the people he was about to save. He was riding into Jerusalem to even become obedient to death on a cross. Do you ever imagine seeing the president allowing himself to be mistreated in this way? Could a wrestler do it? Could you see yourself do it? But this is what Jesus did for us. And why? In order to save us. This was his purpose and goal. Love, love was Jesus' attitude. Love was the reason why he endured humiliation, suffering, and death. Jesus was resolutely going to the cross in order to win our salvation, a salvation that we freely receive through faith in him. Self-sacrificing love is the attitude our Savior had towards us. And it is also the attitude that St. Paul encourages us to have. First verse in our text. Our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. What does this mean? We should be willing to sacrifice ourselves for each other in love for Christ as he did for us. Now some of you might think, that's easy. I would sacrifice myself for anyone in this congregation. I love them. Now I don't doubt that all of us here love each other and would really help each other if there was some major thing that we needed help with. But that's not the point. Would you also do it for minor things? Are you willing to put the welfare of another fellow brother or sister in this congregation ahead of yours? Are you willing to listen to their ideas? Are you willing to put the best construction on what they say, on everything they say, and not blow up at them, even if it's just in your minds blowing up at them because they have offended or insulted or did something towards you. Are you willing to put this congregation's success ahead of your own personal success? Are you willing to humble yourself and not always get your way? Are you willing, even in the most mundane and seemingly lowly ways, serve those people, those very people who really don't seem to deserve our service because they are so thankless in how they act towards us and everything we do? You see, this is the kind of service, a service of love, this is the kind of attitude that Christ has towards us. It's because of his selfless, self-sacrificing love for us that we are saved. This is also the attitude that God wants us to have towards each other in response to his love towards us. Your attitudes should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Unfortunately, we all, all 
myself included, must confess that we don't have this attitude, do we? We struggle with selfishness all the time. In God's righteous eyes, our hearts are as bad as those of professional wrestlers. He sees our hearts. He knows how inside of us we stand on our own rights, how our hearts are unwilling to yield, how we complain. On account of this, we have to bow our heads in shame and say, Lord, when I see your service for me, I stand in shame. Forgive me, Lord, for my selfish attitude. Remind me of your unselfish love that willingly went to the cross to save me. Through faith in your Son, I am your dear child. Help me reflect this truth in my life. Let Christ's service for me be my power and motivation to serve others. Let me not be blinded by the world, but see the true glory in loving service that you, dear Jesus, have exemplified. And you know when we pray that prayer, God hears us. Jesus was humbly riding into Jerusalem to win our forgiveness on Palm Sunday. And win it, he did. All our sins, even our sins of arrogance and selfishness, died with Jesus on the cross. God counts us righteous for Christ's sake. And his righteousness are, is our very own. In the peace of this forgiveness, we can now love each other as Christ loved us. And when we sin, we can go to the cross to receive his forgiveness and once again love each other as Christ loved us. In the peace of forgiveness, let us now see how this Christ-like attitude is also a glorious attitude. Our text continue, continues, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I once had a professor who said, if you see a therefore in the Bible, always ask yourself what it's there for. Verse 9, there's a therefore. And why is that therefore? Therefore. Well, what did God, ex why did God exalt Jesus to the highest place? It's because of what was previous. Because of his humble, self-sacrificing service that saved us from our sins. God was so impressed, so impressed with his son's attitude, his humility, his saving us so much that he exalted Jesus to the highest place. Now someone might say, didn't Jesus have that place before he came to this earth? Yes, according to his divine nature, he did have that place. However, what higher honor could God give, God the Father give his son except that which he already had? And he did exalt Jesus' human nature to that place too, to his throne upon which he already sat. God the Father was so happy with his son's humility, so happy with his son's self-sacrificing love, that he made sure that every person who has existed, who exists today, and who will exist in the future, whether or not they are a believer, whether or they are not there in heaven or hell, they all will have to praise Jesus when he comes again on the last day. Everyone will have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ, this humble servant whom many have despised, truly is our Lord and Savior. Jesus' glory was in his humble service. And God will make sure that his Son is glorified because of this humble service. God's greatest glory is his loving service to us. Guess what God considers our greatest glory? Our greatest glory is his love for us and our love for each other. Out of love for God, let us love each other. Pray that our attitudes might be the same as that of Christ Jesus and then act on that prayer. You know, it won't be easy to do. A 20th century philosopher once said, Hell 
is other people. And certainly it seems that way, doesn't it? But remember, in serving each other in love, you're serving God and glorifying Him. And He considers this your greatest glory. When you're tempted to become selfish or conceited in your attitude towards other people, remember Christ's attitude and service towards you. Let his forgiveness be your comfort and motivation to love as he loved us. On this Palm Sunday, as we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem in humility, let us shout, Hosanna, save us, please. God, save us by humility, by your humility. And dear Lord, save others through us as we reflect your humility in everything we say and do. Amen. Now may God's peace, which is far greater than any mind can understand, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now stand and confess our saving faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed, printed on page 41 in your hymnals, page 41. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Welcome to your Wells Connection. This July, more than a thousand called workers and lay people from across our synod will be gathering in Minnesota for the National Conference on Worship, Music, and the Arts. Held every three years, it's the largest event of its kind organized by any Lutheran church body in the United States. One of the themes this year is passing the baton of sacred music from one generation to the next. Two attendees are examples of what the theme is all about. As a Lutheran elementary school teacher, Mary Prangy has devoted her adult life to teaching a new generation about the joys of sacred music. And my experience is that kids can really learn to love hymns. And not only easy hymns, but hymns that really have some doctrinal content. They can learn to sing those, and they, they learn the language of the church. On this day, she has her students singing a piece by Bach based on the words of Psalm 150. When they learn something that really has lasting value, they don't forget that. And a piece like that is much more memorable to them than something that might be a little more trite musically. We praise God. We worship Him. We're supposed to. Like, we love Him for what He has done for us. Like, He died on the cross for us, took all our sins away. Jesus died on the cross, and, you, and He took away your sins, and that's singing is how you can praise Him. Throughout her years as a teacher, Mary has made it a point to identify particular students with musical gifts and abilities and to encourage them to develop their talents. Case in point is Adrian Smith, who now serves at another congregation as a music minister. His interest in music all started some 20 years ago when he enrolled at the school where Mary was teaching. Adrian came to our school in sixth grade 
and I was the sixth grade teacher. And I was walking down the hall and she said, well, you know, do you sing? Would you like to come and inquire? And I said, sure. You know, I, I was pretty shy. And he was a pretty shy uh, young gentleman. And we had a musical, uh, The Trial of the Big Bad Wolf, it was called. Oh yeah, The Trial of the Big Bad Wolf. <laughs> I heard this nice little soprano voice out of Adrian, and I gave him a part in that play. She gave me my first break, I guess you could say. <laughs> from that first exposure, Adrian then took piano and organ lessons from Mary and continued in choral music throughout high school and then through his years at Martin Luther College. What makes his experience so remarkable is that there was very little musical talent or interest in his own family. It was very important for me, when I look back on, on my life, to have somebody like, like Mary Prangy who um, saw the talent that I had and who gave me opportunities in church and in school to be able to use that, that talent and to, to grow in it. God certainly used Mary uh, to accomplish His, his purposes and, and accomplish the plans that He had for me. From the rising of the sun And now Adrian is taking the lessons he learned and putting them into practice with his own group of young singers. But she really impressed upon me the importance of, of sacred music in, in our worship life and how important it is to teach children, even at a young age, what it means to sing music, not only scripturally sound, but music that actually is edifying in worship. The key to getting kids to appreciate the music they're singing, he says, is answering a basic question. Why are we singing this song? Well, um, it's because we are approaching this time in the church year, and this is what the pastor is going to be talking about in worship. Uh, helping them to make the connections between what music we do and what's going on in worship. Both Mary and Adrian realize that not all of these students will become accomplished musicians, but that's not the goal. What is? Instilling um, in them the love of, of music and the love of um, performing to the best of their ability, whether it be in school or in church, giving them opportunities to be able to use the music abilities they have. That they learn that singing is a great part of praising God, that they can use their voices in worship. That's, I think that's the major goal. For details about the Worship Conference, visit wells.net slash wellsconnection. There you'll also find information about how you can support young people who would want to attend the conference but might not be able to otherwise. Or take a look at this month's Wells Connection close-up insert. That's all for this month. Until next time, God be with you. bell choir as the offerings are presented.
Lord Jesus, you are the King of heaven and on earth. We join the first Palm Sunday worshipers in praising and glorifying you for coming to this earth to be our Savior. Though you are one with God the Father and Lord of all, you humbled yourself and became one with us. Thanks be to you for living a perfect life of perfect conformity to God's law in our place. Praise be to you for being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Cause our voices to blend with those who sang your praises as you rode into Jerusalem. Move us to confess you before others as our Lord. Help us proclaim the message of peace and forgiveness to people, the people of all nations. Use us to assure all people that your blood has cleansed them from sin and set them free from slavery to sin, death, and the devil. Move us to dedicate all that we are and have to your glory. Lord Jesus, you are king over all the earth. Bless the nations of this world with wise rulers and good governments. Let peace prevail. Grant success to the businesses and industries of our land to serve for the common good. Cause all employers to be honest and fair-minded with all employees, and employees to be diligent and faithful. Look with favor on our nation's schools. Be with those who teach and those who learn. Comfort the sick and the afflicted with the assurance of your care and protection, and strengthen the faith of the dying. Dear Lord, we come before you on behalf of those members in our congregation who have birthdays. Alan Zellner, David Dodden, Taylor Jaden, Maynard Keel, Gail Zellner, Nikayla Novak, Ben Dorner, Chad Kickbush, Catherine Neumeyer, Yvonne Booth, Delbert Buss, Bill Hartke, London Carnup, Michael Stauber, and also be with those who have anniversaries, Daryl and Monica Graff, Ed and Janelle Rina, uh, Ria, uh, we ask you, dear Lord, to be with them and continue to bless them in the year to come. We thank you especially for bringing them to faith. Continue to bless them in that faith, that their focus their entire lives may be on you and the eternal life that you have prepared for us in your Son. Dear Savior, as we walk with you this week toward Calvary, keep us focused on your promise for coming into this world and on our calling to spread this wonderful message of salvation. Hear us for your name's sake, as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We will now hear the choir sing, Hosanna, loud Hosanna.
final prayer and blessing. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Let us remain standing as we sing our final hymn, hymn 133, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. of announcements. First of all, uh, the flower arrangement that's here under the lectern is from the funeral of Norbert Vanderkin, Eunice's brother, which took place this past Tuesday. Please keep her and the rest of the family in your prayers. Other announcements is that there is going to be a council meeting after church this morning. And also I wanted to draw attention to this being the first day of Holy Week, our Holy Week services that are coming up. Monday, Thursday will be at 7 p.m. Now I want to do a little bit of a forewarning. I'm trying to shorten the service, but it's not going to be a short service. It'll be between an hour and an hour and a half long service. I know that's a long service for the evening, but it's a beautiful service. It's looking uh, at the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples, that conversation he had recorded in the Gospel of John from chapters 13 through 17, actually at the beginning of, verse, of chapter 18. So it's a big chunk of scripture that we're looking at. 
And it'll be a song and scripture service. So even though it's a long service, I still invite you all to come. As I said, I'm doing my best to shorten it, that it won't be more, that it'll be closer to the hour than the hour and a half. But that's the Monday Thursday worship that I encourage all of you to come to. Good Friday worship will be a tenebrae service, a service of darkness. That will be in the afternoon and the evening. It will focus on the seven words Jesus spoke from the cross as he was winning our salvation. There will be no communion this Good Friday. It will be on Monday, Thursday and on Easter Sunday. So it's a non-communion service at 1 o'clock and 7 o'clock. Easter will be a sunrise service. It will be more, a, the sunrise service will be a song service with scripture lessons and a short devotion. And then in the after, in the, the service afterwards, after the brunch, after the breakfast, will be a festival service that will have communion because it's a communion Sunday and have a regular sermon. Those are going to be the services on Easter. Uh, I found out too late now and I, where I didn't think it through. Usually I'm used to smaller sunrise services and bigger festival services and that's why I planned it. But I found out here it's just the opposite. So um, next year I'll try to correct that where the festival service will be earlier and the uh, after service will be later. But that's our worship schedule for this Easter. I encourage all of you to, to, to come and celebrate in all those services the wonderful salvation that the Lord has accomplished for us. That's all the announcements I have unless I forgot any or anyone has any. If not, then I wish you God's blessings this week.